Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Marianne Lindy, and I'm with KPMG's Microsoft Alliance focused on healthcare. Thank you for joining our cybersecurity webinar this morning. We'll be talking about how to create an integrated approach methodology that avoids data breaches. And the topics that we'll cover today will include zero trust conditional access. Blake, would you please let everyone know how they can receive one continuing professional education credit from today's session? Blake, you're on mute. Okay, can everyone hear me? Here we go. Let me send myself yes. live. Okay, so in order, to, so here we go. During this session, we'll be utilizing Poll Everywhere to track participants for CPE credit. From your laptop or from your mobile device, navigate to pollev.com slash NOV4. Please enter your full name when prompted. Do not skip. Keep the Poll Everywhere window open. You'll need to, you'll need it through the training. I've also provided the link in the chat. For your check-in, please make sure to submit your first name, last name, email address as shown on screen. The check-in will remain open for the full first polling question. KPMG is, a, is a, 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 approved by NASBA to deliver CPE, CPE worthy training. In order to receive CPE credit, you must attend the entire session. Complete both the check in and check out and poll everywhere. Participate in all polling questions. Please note participation is tracked and failure to participate will result in a denial of CPE credit. Thanks, Blake. So you can see um, that today's session is going to cover these topics. Um, we're going to focus on the challenges with today's um, today's governance structure and how to create a unified data and information governance. And we'll also talk about how to secure your healthcare organization with zero trust across um, by, by securing it with zero trust and provide protection across the attack chain from insider and external threats. Blake, would you please advance the slides? Now I'd like to introduce our three esteemed speakers today. First, we have Anurag Rai from KPMG's cybersecurity team, followed by Raj Bahal, also from KPMG's cybersecurity team, and Raj will be responding first to the questions that you place in the chat today. And finally, we have Joseph Davis, the Chief Security Advisor from Microsoft. Joseph, would you please take our next slide? Certainly. Thank you, Marianne. So uh, one of the reasons um, I joined Microsoft about three years ago is because Microsoft's approach to cybersecurity has uh, shifted wildly in the last five, six years. Um, and it's really in response to um, navigating in a, a shifting cyber world. We've seen attacks growing more sophisticated. We've seen conventional security tools not keeping pace. And that was one of the challenges I had in, in past um, professions and, and roles where um, I led security for major manufacturing companies. And then lastly, um, the regulatory landscape is becoming more and more complex with, you know, well over 50 individual regulations in the United States around privacy and uh, hundreds of regulations around the world. So Microsoft's um, taking an approach to all of this. We'll talk about that uh, within the uh, presentation. I think we can transition to the next slide. Thanks, thanks, Joseph. Uh, uh, along with along with the cybersecurity uh, environment getting increasingly complicated, the data environment is also becoming very uh, complicated. 
And and what that really means is that there are different personas that uh, work in your enterprise uh, that have uh, that have a say in using and protecting data, but they are all coming at this from different uh, objectives in mind. So what becomes uh, very important is to make sure that we have um, uh, shared capabilities that essentially help you drive the adoption of data in a secure and compliant way. At the same time, navigating the cybersecurity threat as you as you go along. If you move to the next slide, you'll see that. Um, really the the model that we have today with different elements of data as well as uh, different personas trying to trying to use data or adopt the use of data. Basically, it ends in a spaghetti bowl type of situation with a very siloed um, uh, approach to managing data. Um, uh, it's, it's inefficient. It uh, exposes your data to uh, potential cybersecurity risks and also creates a lot of compliance um, nightmares as you kind of deal with increasing uh, increasing regulations around privacy and data protection. If you move to the next slide, we'll talk about. At this time, uh, please navigate to the poll everywhere question, uh, poll everywhere and answer the poll question to get your CP credit. And I think Blake, you need to read that. Um, yeah, here specific. we go. At this time, please navigate to the poll everywhere window and submit your answer to the polling question. We'll give it. We'll give everyone about thirty seconds to answer, and then we'll move on. So as as we saw in the earlier slide, because of the increasing complexity of the cyber world as well as the as the data world, they uh, they now uh, we now have a situation where we have to really kind of adopt a very streamlined and unified approach to manage data at scale. And 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 what that really means is that we need to put together a governance structure with policies, processes, people, technology, uh, data as well as governance, and making sure that all of these work together to drive the adoption of data in the enterprise, right? And, and we'll talk about some of the details as we go into the next slide, but really the intent is to use data as an asset, make sure that you, uh, you are using it in a compliant and secure way. So KPMG having done work with a variety of companies uh, like yours uh, considers a very unique approach to solving this problem. We we call it a unified data and information governance approach, but the core of the philosophy here is to make sure that we understand data both as an asset as well as a risk, and we talk about value creation as well as value enablement in the entire spectrum of protecting data. We, we uh, really kind of think about this from all the different angles, uh, using data for business growth, things like automation, analytics, user experience, transformation, operational ex excellence, uh, but at the same time, making sure that you have, um, you know, the security, the investigations, the privacy, the risk management, the resilience and compliance taken into consideration as you kind of think about evolving the data. And what that really requires, if you move to the next slide, Blake, you want to talk about the CPE question? Yep, here we go. At this time, please navigate to the Poll Everywhere website and submit your answer to the polling question. We'll be giving everyone about 30 seconds to answer the question and then we'll move on.
Yeah, so, so as we saw in the previous slide, the unique approach that KPMG has been taking with our clients is really to kind of build this unified framework. But what that really focuses on is to make sure that your enterprise governance is redesigned and realigned to meet the new demands of data organization. That would include things like how you uh, uh, govern the use of data. We'll talk about details and, and some leading practices there. How do you kind of communicate and adapt the plan? How do you socialize and and mobilize the plan for the for the for the enterprise at at large? We also talk about making sure that you have a a, a very distinct way to address the the needs from an enterprise regulatory as well as risk landscape perspective. And these would mean the controls that you have to apply at uh, for for uh, for data. At, at different levels of, of the journey from all the way from creation to destruction of data, but assigning a unique value to the data because we all know that we can't protect everything and all data are not created equal. So we want to be able to make sure that we create something like a data value model that helps us define as to what level of controls can be applied to, to data at what, what time. And, and thereby make it more optimized and efficient from a cost perspective. At the same time, we got to be able to make sure that our operating mo model supports really the, 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 the infrastructure we are putting in place, which would require us to put together a set of policies, procedures, metrics to measure how we, how we report the use of data, how we report the compliance and security uh, aspects of data as well, as well as an integrated architecture that we'll talk about with respect to how Microsoft is thinking about it, but really an integrated architecture that bring together all the disparate tools and technologies that your enterprise has so that you can create a, a value system or an ecosystem of, of products that can help you solve uh, and the, the, the problems around security, privacy and compliance of data at large. We also want to focus on some of the external external functions that dictate the use of data, privacy, third party risks, uh, you know, data management, your partners and so on that essentially have to be redeveloped so that you can apply this to the new model on how you exchange data from external sources. So this whole holistic approach essentially helps you think through uh, the entire security, privacy and, and compliance life cycle of managing data at scale. If you move to the next slide. We'll see some examples of how KPMG has helped uh, these different stakeholders uh, think through uh, from their perspective on how to manage the risks associated with uh, adoption of, of data at scale. And, and here in this example, we're seeing that an integrated policies and control framework that helps you define uh, the, the, the policies around data risk, standards around data risk, the risk and control catalog that basically brings a unified compliance, be it security or privacy, whatever the need be, so that we are not uh, building individual controls for different data elements or privacy regulations or security regulations requirements apply a standard of care. So we talked about data value model, assigning an intrinsic value to every data element and thereby making sure that we apply a standard of care across the spectrum based on the value that the data has for the enterprise and then making sure that we have controls and procedures all the way from protecting data at rest, data in motion and in use so that you know appropriately that can be applied universally for the for the entire enterprise. If you move to the next slide, we we then look at how this kind of translates into a security posture and similar to what we saw from a compliance and, and controls perspective, security has uh, multiple things that need to come together as well. So we we have to think about security as a continuum all the way from experience where we we think about Things like the, the login flows, personalization uh, to, to the identity and access management areas, which are things like single sign-on, 
proofing of identities, advanced authentication, passwordless type situations, uh, self-service, and, and so on, all the way to managing threats at scale, so making sure that you understand the threat ecosystem, the scenario, uh, targeted attacks that could come after your data elements, uh, anomaly detection, event correlation to ensure that you can respond to incidents and triage them appropriately, Ma mon managing fraud. I think that's a key aspect of ensuring that the data is not just protected and secured, but also while the data is being used, you eliminate the uh, the scope of any fraud as it relates to behavioral analytics or risk scoring of identities or fraud policies, making sure that the endpoints that host data are protected, uh, making sure the application development cycles uh, itself is secured, and then also ensuring that the, the, the overall um, compliance as well as privacy regulations are factored in and kind of translated into security controls. All in all, thinking about governance as well as making sure that you have a robust operations and support center to manage the scale because as you can imagine with the use of data the adoption increasing you'll see a slew of events being pumped into your security operations center and the like which needs to be addressed appropriately so you have to think about that as well if you move to the next slide At this time, please navigate to the Poll Everywhere window and submit your answer to the polling question. We'll be giving everyone about 30 seconds to answer the question. Yeah, so, so not to make it more complex, but you'll see that privacy brings in another, another dimension that we earlier didn't think in the, in the cycle um, you know, early enough, right? So, so now, as we think about privacy as a center stage and a basic expectation from consumers and other stakeholders, right? Regulators and government agencies and so on and so forth, I think this brings another layer of complication. The, the, the good news part of this is that you, you today there's there are frameworks, there are uh, controls and so on that you can um, you can use to develop a privacy framework that helps you um, kind of uh, align that to your security as well as your control landscape. And what that really means is that you can optimize because uh, you know wherever there's a tangential privacy control that kind of piggybacks on a security control, you can apply it at the same time. So you're kind of securing by design as well as privacy by design is being applied as well. So you don't have to think about this as an afterthought. And as you're kind of thinking about uh, the use of data, applications, services, business models that you are you are kind of developing based on data, you can incorporate privacy principles as you go and then obviously make sure that the security as well as your risk and control uh, frameworks are aligned to that as well. So all in all, the, the, the net here is to make sure that you understand that there, there are frameworks today that other clients like yourselves have used to bring the entire holistic uh, focus on data all the way from making sure that you have robust policies, procedures, controls, uh, have a way to apply them based on the value of the data. You have a framework to apply different security controls using different technologies that you already have in your enterprise, and then making sure that you overlay the privacy principles on top of it so that the data is not just secure, but also honors the privacy expectations that, that your client customers and, and other entities have from you. So if you move to the next slide, 
I think a very key aspect is, as we saw in the in the beginning, there are different stakeholders that control different elements of this of this ecosystem. So, so there's usually a, a chief data officer or a chief digital officer who is charged with um, charged with uh, running the data agenda, developing business models, and using data at large. There's obviously the chief information security officer who who uh, is is, uh, is uh, responsible for managing uh, the, the security aspects. There are usually privacy uh, off offices or the, the legal office that helps with the privacy side of this. There's a risk officer that kind of looks at this from a risk perspective. But the key part here is to create some sort of a governance model that essentially helps you drive this in a collaborative way. And you'll see on the slide there's an example of how you can kind of unwind the entire spaghetti bowl that you saw earlier, where you can streamline uh, the different uh, stakeholders, create something like an enterprise data governance group um, that could use one of your one of your um, existing committees or maybe a new committee that you can form that helps you set policies through appropriate participation of each of these individuals or, or roles in an enterprise that makes you, uh, helps you lead the coordination of the program. It makes it easy to comply through um, well-implemented technology in a, in a holistic way, as well as make sure that you are in compliance with all the regulations and so on and so forth. So I think this is really how we are seeing a lot of enterprises at scale adopt uh, the use of data uh, as a as a differentiator or a business enabler, at the same time uh, caring uh, about uh, uh, you know the the entire expectations from security, privacy, as well as compliance. At this so point, Rag, I would like to. Rag, uh, you just touched upon a very interesting topic, and in fact, there's a question in the um, forum for the same. The question is: the hardest thing I am facing is to help my organization become data driven and leverage efficiency of technology. Can you share what are the first obvious steps that I need to take to bring them together? I think it's a good uh, segue to answer that question. Can you elaborate yeah. on that a bit? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks, Arjun. So I think the, the, the first thing that we are seeing enterprises do is to make sure that once you have clearly articulated your vision around how you want to use data in terms of services or, or, or a business model that you're looking to drive, you then need to look inwards to bring these disparate stakeholders together in some sort of a forum that can help you define all these agendas, which is really, hey, what am I going to do with the data? What risks does it bring to the enterprise that didn't exist before? And then how do I kind of now think about scaling up my infrastructure, whether from a security side or control side to 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 align to the sort of changing uh, needs of the business, right? I think that's where we we want to start off with. You'll see that in 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 some cases you already are doing a lot of stuff in terms of making sure that data is tagged, appropriately identified and so on and so forth. I think what you need to really kind of make sure is you kind of develop the entire end to end of where data is being used. What's the flow? Where is it going? Is it going to a cloud provider? Is it going to another business? And then create that entire spectrum as we talked about of, of uh, the security, privacy, as well as compliance controls that are needed to protect it. Thanks, Anurag. So at this point, I'll I'll like to bring in Joseph Davis, who, whom you heard earlier, and he'll talk about how Microsoft and KPMG are kind of thinking about this jointly using Microsoft's offering in the market as well as uh, the, the technologies that Microsoft has been innovating on. Thank you, Anurag. Let's transition to the next slide, please. So um, one of my favorite slides, when we're talking about tooling here, we're shifting gears and we're going to talk about the current cy uh, cybersecurity cyberscape, right? So we're looking at all of the vendors on the market today 
Um, I do believe the slide is actually updated from what is published here, even though this is the 2021 version. I think they've updated it since um, the beginning of the year. Um, the problem with this tooling model is that it's just overwhelming, right? So if you're um, responsible for security in your organization, you're going to be, um, even as a practitioner uh, or a leader, you're, you're going to be um, saddled with trying to understand all of these vendors, um, making sure they don't become shelfware after they're purchased. Um, and we, Microsoft believes that, you know, the cost of acquisition ownership and intelligence around all of these products is not sustainable. Uh, for instance, you know, you think about having to onboard uh, hundreds, um, if not maybe 50 products in your organization to protect it and to remain compliant. You're looking at a procurement process around each and every one of those. You're looking at architecture and governance around each and every one of those. Um, and then there could be legal and privacy processes that are attached to each one of these as well, because um, let's face it, you know, when we're doing um, cybersecurity and monitoring, we're, uh, you know, uh, bumping up against uh, data privacy uh, re requirements um, outside of the U.S. Uh, in, and the cost of ownership for deploying and operating, making sure that these uh, tools are up to date is, uh, again, not sustainable. And the cost of intelligence, um, uh, I recall that several of these vendors, when when um, I, I was a chief information security officer and we, we acquired several of these vendors, that uh, the, the, the threat intelligence that, that came with these vendors was somewhat anemic, right? Uh, so what we were forced to do is kind of go out on the market and look for uh, threat intelligence solutions, subscriptions, et cetera, that were uh, very, very expensive in order to integrate uh, uh, those uh, solutions into our environment. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's it's something to think about, right? So uh, what I'd like you to take away from this particular slide is uh, this is un this is not sustainable. This is not affordable. Um, so we need to find a better way. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So at, at Microsoft, what we're trying to achieve here is to protect absolutely everything. When we see a gap in the marketplace, um, a gap in our product line, um, what we're doing is rushing to fill that gap. We're making sure that we're either acquiring technologies or developing technologies to fill those uh, security and compliance gaps. Um, we're also simplifying the complex, right? So you saw the last slide how, slide how complex integrating all of those individual technologies would be, um, not just costly, but very complicated. Microsoft's approach is, is to simplify with, um, instead of a best of breed approach, a best of suite approach. Um, we're trying to catch what other technologies miss and the, and. Um, you'll see a little bit more about how we do that, but uh, the, the main theme here is that we're going to um, be able to have each component within the security suite communicate with every other component in the security suite so that your entire ecosystem is covered from um, a detection and prevention uh, point of view. And then uh, because all of these technologies that Microsoft has to offer are cloud-based technologies, um, which can, by the way, protect and defend on-prem, hybrid, uh, other clouds. Um, you know, the growth of these solutions is a matter of uh, waiting for features to become generally available. It's not something that our customers have to go out, acquire, deploy in their in their environments and uh, maintain themselves because ma many of these solutions are software as a service, um, that, that maintenance, that uh, infrastructure overhead is um, is really on on Microsoft. It's not on the on the customer. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So Microsoft's approach to security is unique and open. We are a cloud native open platform. Uh, we're trying to again reduce those that dependence on all of those third party solutions where integrating capabilities uh, based on identity because identity is really the the point where 
uh, threat actors have exploited um, the acquisition of username and password to get into the um, corporate ecosystem. We're also uh, working on a frictionless user experience, uh, meaning you, you're, uh, the user is not saddled with having to do things like in, in the middle of the workday, you know, to access certain applications, log on to a VPN, or um, have a separate authentication experience for each application. Um, and then unmatched threat intelligence. Microsoft has an amazing amount of threat intelligence it's collecting with its cloud-based solutions. And um, that threat intelligence is uh, curated with machine learning. And it is fed throughout the, the uh, Microsoft platform to every uh, Defender product that we have. Um, and then we also provide access to threat and response professionals right from our consoles. So if you need a threat expert to help you through an incident or something you haven't seen before in your environment, Microsoft is there to help you with that. Um, and it's really an end-to-end -end threat protection. There's gonna be a slide coming up that shows the uh, cyber attack chain and where Microsoft, uh, some of Microsoft's um, solutions uh, you know, fall into each one of those attack areas and how they detect and prevent those types of attacks. And lastly, um, the, the cost of um, having, you know, dozens of individuals securing your environment is not sustainable. So what we um, are working diligently on is ensuring that we have um, automated uh, remediation of, of all kinds of threats using um, our security orchestration and response uh, you know, um, solutions in that, that respect. Then we've got, of course, we go across uh, not just Microsoft Cloud, but uh, we, we defend the public clouds as well. AW, we can integrate with AWS and Google Cloud. We support all of the major popular endpoints, including Linux, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and of course, Windows. Um, and yeah, I just mentioned the, the operating systems for the mobile devices that we manage. And then anything that's legacy, we have um, products to defend and detect and defend um, IoT, Edge, and legacy uh, equipment in your environment as well. So Joseph, uh, interesting question has come up. Uh, so there are so many products and source available, right? Uh, and there's a vast, breadth of the coverage. Uh, we are covering the IoT devices, mobile uh, devices, endpoints, uh, public cloud. So what is Microsoft uh, doing to make it simpler? There was very interesting. That was one of the themes you touched upon on the previous slide. Uh, the question is that uh, how are we making it simpler and seamless for the uh, our customers to manage it? Yeah, we have a single SKU for security and uh, we were able to sell uh, the, that subscription as a single solution. Um, and then we, uh, of course, we encourage our customers to partner with uh, our partners like KPMG to um, really just be, uh, come up to speed on each one of the areas that Microsoft is providing detection and, and defense. Uh, and then uh, what, what happens here is that from an integration standpoint, you don't necessarily have to uh, rely upon open APIs in order to integrate the products. With Microsoft, um, each product is pretty much self-aware. It's going to it's going to understand that you have um, other components of the integrated suite in the enterprise, and it's going to automatically integrate or integrate with the click of a button. Okay. Thanks, Joseph. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Well, this, this slide just demonstrates um, how Microsoft is collecting its enormous amount of uh, uh, threat intelligence, right? We, we consume trillions of signals from our services 
every day. Uh, we make billions of predictions with our machine learning models, and there are millions of actions that come from those predictions. So if we see something that is a potential zero day attack, we're, we're seeing that based on its behavior and behavior of things that have come before. Right, and that's where those predictions come in. So we're getting the information from scanning documents and blocking threats across all of our customers' ecosystems, analyzing malicious emails, analyzing malicious URLs, um, pulling information from uh, data exchange uh, within Teams, and um, looking at how identities are authenticating into the Microsoft Cloud. So all of that information, um, it gives us the ability to determine uh, what's abnormal from what's normal and then share that information throughout the Microsoft uh, security and compliance stack. Next slide, please. Here we're going to be talking about zero trust. I'm really excited about zero trust and that um, it's been around, the concept's been around for a while, but uh, this is, you know, we're on the, the edge of actually implementing zero trust across, all, you know, any customer that uh, understands the concepts and uh, is able to um, take the risk of their identities and take the risk of their devices and feed it into uh, the security policy enforcement engine. This is not your traditional uh, zero trust network access. This is a zero trust user and resource access. So look at the model as a computer science 101 type of uh, framework, right? Where we're taking the input, the risk of the identities and the devices, we're making a decision on that risk and then determining whether or not these identities and devices should gain access to data apps, infrastructure and network, right? So um, it's all based on the uh, least privileged assume breach um, approach. Uh, so we trust nothing and we verify everything. And, and this happens not just at point of authentication, but this happens uh, throughout the cycle, the life cycle of the session, right? So if, if during uh, my workday something occurs that is, indicates to the system, to the security policy enforcement system that my identity has been compromised, my access to sensitive information, either direct to data or through an application or certain types of infrastructure will be restricted, right? I might still be able to get at non-sensitive information, but based on my disposition, I can't get at very, very sensitive information until um, I'm able to either uh, prove I am who I say I am through multi-factor authentication, or uh, my device uh, becomes cleaner with respect to its hygiene. Next slide, please. And he, in this uh, slide, we're talking about how Microsoft protects across the attack chain. Uh, so this is a protection against both insider and external threats. I think one of the things that we're, we all need to recognize is that many times what we see, what seems to be an insider threat is actually an uh, external threat because that uh, identity is being impersonated by an external user or an external threat actor. So uh, across the kill chain here, we, we understand this kill chain model. It's, it's a model that's repeated over and over again with, with um, attacks against identity to gain access to uh, enterprise resources um, with the elevation of privileges and, and lateral movement of the threat actor. So at the front end of this attack chain is the, of course, the traditional phishing email, right? So that comes in two flavors. Either there's an attachment, malicious attachment uh, associated with that email, or there's a, a URL that when clicked um, is malicious and is able to either grab session token or it's able to grab a um, username and password or trick a user into filling out a form that uh, gives, gives away username and password, right? So our defense against this is Defender for Office 365. And it's not just email, it goes across all the modalities of Office 365 and all the applications under the Office 365 umbrella. So if there's a malicious link in today's Teams meeting, it's going to detect that. Um, if there's a malicious link um, in, in a document, it's going to detect that. If if something is, uh, malware is uploaded into Office 365, either for OneDrive for Business or in SharePoint, that malware is going to be detected. It's going to be network sandbox. It's going to be analyzed for what it does. 
um, and it's going to determine to be either you know legitimate or um, you know behaving abnormally. Um, the next and the signal is shared with defender for endpoints. A good example of this is if um, malware is detected in attachments that the malware signal uh, that it's detected um, and it was detected on specific endpoints that receive that message, that signal is going to go out to Defender for Endpoints um, and Azure Defender to shut that malware down at the endpoint uh, before it can cause harm and before it can replicate throughout the organization. The next point of protection is uh, protecting Azure Active Directory, which is our cloud-based uh, identity service, right? So we have identity protection built into Azure Active Directory that will diminish the um, effects of a brute force account attack or um, a password spray attack. And it's it's also able to detect stolen uh, or reused credentials. So if I'm reusing credentials um, or a password across social media, and then I decide to use that same password for my corporate account, um, if one of those social media um, accounts is uh, breached and is and is now available for sale on the dark market. Um, Azure Active Directory is going to detect that, compare that password hash with my current corporate password hash, and, and notice that they're one and the same, and it's going to force me to change my password. Microsoft's also going after um, a passwordless environment, which is kind of the next step in this journey. So what we're trying to do is el eliminate the need for that hash comparison altogether by eliminating passwords. Um, the next is for uh, customers that are using Active Directory on-premises, which is pretty much everyone. Um, we have a um, product called Defender for Identity that sits as a, a packet capture agent, if you will, on domain controllers. Doesn't have uh, a net negative effect on the domain controller's performance because uh, basically it sends all of the data that's collected out to the cloud to be uh, to the Azure cloud to be analyzed to determine if there's reconnaissance being done against Active Directory, if there are live off the land type of tax against Active Directory using things like PS Exec or NS Lookup or NetStat, et cetera, um, or, or just net.exe. Um, it's also able to detect if um, a user account has been compromised and if that account is now attacking um, uh, other applications using pass the hash or a golden ticket attacks. So it's very astute at um, detecting identity based attacks and privilege elevation within the Active Directory world. And then uh, lastly, in the kill chain above is that um, we have what was once known, it's the, the name of this product has changed this week during the Ignite conference, but it was once known as Microsoft Cloud App Security, and, and now it's Defender for Cloud. So this is watching everything that's going on with cloud services. They don't necessarily have to be Microsoft cloud services. It could be Dropbox, Box, Workday, SAP, et cetera. Um, any, anything that um, exists external to the ecosystem, right? So uh, with this product, we're, we're not only able to detect this, uh, to understand the sensitivity and the context of the data that's being transferred. We understand who's doing the, um, who's doing the, the transfer, what device they're coming from, and where the data is being transferred to. So all kinds of policies can be placed upon that, that data transfer if that data transfer is inappropriate, right? So a good example of this is that um, I have something sensitive. It hasn't been announced to the public yet, and I want to copy and paste that and into a document and upload that document into my own personal Dropbox account. Um, Microsoft Cloud App Security is going to detect that, detect that whether I'm doing it from my iOS device or I'm doing it from my Windows 10 device. It really doesn't matter. And it doesn't really matter where I am either. I don't have to be behind the corporate firewall in order for that detection to occur. Because remember, there's... Um, there are components that are running on my endpoint, like Defender for Endpoint, that are picking up on that uh, that data transference, um, and also picking up on things like did did I print sensitive information? Did I copy um, large amounts of uh, sensitive information? Have I deleted 
uh, large amounts of, of information in general, whether it's sensitive or not, depending on what those policies are. And that's when we start to talk about insider risk. But before I talk about insider risk in this in this uh, slide, let's talk a little bit about Azure Sentinel. Azure Sentinel is uh, now known as Microsoft uh, Sentinel, and uh, it essentially is our SIM SOAR uh, utility or tool where we're collecting signals from all of these uh, individual components as a, as a single entity above. Um, and we're also collecting signal from all non Microsoft uh, products in your ecosystem because we understand not not all of our customers are, are using Microsoft products exclusively for security and compliance. So we can interface with Cisco and, and Symantec and McAfee and, and all these other uh, security technologies that were part of that cyberscape slide that I showed you earlier. We can pull information from those um, uh, entities and those tools to correlate that information uh, uh, from what we're seeing in uh, the the defenders uh, that are above right and uh, if if you choose not to go with azure sentinel as your sim or microsoft sentinel as your sim it, you you can still um, see that correlation of all of these technologies and that sharing of signal in um, the defender dashboard um, so that and you can take any of that information that is surfaced in the defender dashboard and move it into your sim of choice um, and lastly, I'm talking about insider risk. As we're picking up signals throughout the attack chain, um, those signals can be used for several different things. One, compliance, uh, but two, things like um, attack surface area on uh, individuals' devices. Uh, because we're collecting all hardware and software inventory on all the devices that are under our control, under management, um, we're able to see things like vulnerabilities of hardware, vulnerabilities of firmware, uh, vulnerabilities that exist with uh, both Microsoft patching and uh, third party application patches that may or may not have been applied. Um, and of course, anything zero day related. Uh, but we're also picking up on uh, user behavior or UEBA, right? So we can pick up on things like history of HR violations, distracted and careless workers who are sending sensitive documents without um, the appropriate data protection. Um, disgruntled or disenchanted users uh, who are uh, sometimes subject to stressors and make mistakes. Um, we can see that insiders have access to sensitive data. We could pick we can pick up an, an anomalous uh, activity, uh, data leakage and potential sabotage. Good, good uh, indications of this are either a um, user is compromised and their identity is doing things that haven't has have never been done before, possibly coming from a device that's unregistered or possibly coming from a registered device that the system has never seen that user use before. Right, so all of these are key indicators, or maybe they're coming from an embargoed country when they um, uh, do what they're doing, or maybe you'll have somebody in accounting who's trying to access HR records that are outside of the scope of their role. So all of that information is going to be detected with insider risk management. And I believe as we transition to the next slide, I believe there's a, a CPE question. There is. So at this time, please navigate to the Poll Everywhere window and submit your answer to the polling question. And we'll give everyone about 30 seconds to answer this question, then we'll move on to the next slide. At this time, 
Please navigate to the Poll Everywhere window and submit your checkout. Please be sure to submit your first name, last name, email address as shown on screen. We'll be giving one just a few more minutes or a few more seconds to answer that first poll question and and check out and then we'll move on. Thanks for being patient. Thank you, Blake. Yeah, I'm just um, the the last um, topic I wanted to bring up is you know we have many many health and life sciences customers, and that's that's the uh, focus. That's my focus area is health and life sciences, because I was originally a, a CISO at a health and life sciences manufacturing company, um, and that's that's I've been working with health and life sciences for uh, most of my career, 26 year career. Um, and we, um, during my tenure at Microsoft, uh, St. Luke's, one of my customers, St. Luke's University decided to go all in on the Microsoft cybersecurity and compliance identity and, and de device management um, approach. And they, they've had a lot of success with this, right? So this is, um, feel free to, um, you know, use the links in this presentation to view the customer story. Um, and, uh, you know, they're they're just a great reference customer in this and the great in the fantastic success they've had with kind of um, moving away from that best of breed overhead to moving into more of a stream streamlined integrated approach that Microsoft provides. Um, and at this time, I, I'd like to turn it over to Marianne for some uh, key takeaways. Thanks, Joseph. So. Um, we know that cyber attacks have been growing in sophistication and security measures haven't been keeping pace all the while regulatory requirements are increasing. So really it's about having multiple groups under the CISO, the CDO, the CRO coming together with clearly defined roles and operating a unified governance across policies, processes, people, technology, and the data and information. So it's our perspective that now more than ever, it's just so important to secure your healthcare organization with zero trust, to verify explicitity, use least privilege access, and assume breaches. Would love to open up the um, last uh, eight minutes that we have here for any additional questions and also let everyone know um, if you want to receive a copy of today's presentation or uh, KPMG also has a white paper um, on this topic, feel, feel free to um, email me um, you know, or any of our speakers and, and we can arrange for that. So Raj, are there any um, questions that you think we, uh, we should uh, um, spend a little bit more time on? Thanks, Mary. And uh, there are in fact a couple of interesting questions. Uh, Joseph, you while the presentation you talked about the cyber hygiene right of the enterprise so there is a question related to that uh, we talk about enterprise cyber hygiene in our organization can you, you share your perspective uh, to take the right actions what should uh, typically a customer do so that the cyber hygiene in the enterprise is addressed properly you're never going to get 100% cyber hygiene or 100% secure, you know, and the, and you got to make sure that you're you're uh, very vocal about that with you know, you know your your business leaders, right? Uh, this is a this is a risk practice or risk reduction or risk management practice. The easiest way to uh, to get to a cyber hygiene is with attack surface reduction. Let me give you an example. So, um, in, in my in my own environment, um, I use Microsoft Intune's built-in policy of attack surface reduction, um, either in monitor mode or in in full mode. Meaning, you know, it's actually implementing attack surface reduction. Essentially, when a, a device comes under management, um, all the appropriate configurations are downloaded onto that device. Um, based on you know CIS benchmarking and uh, you know years and years of, of device hardening experience, um, and it's nuanced, so it doesn't affect the end user's ability to, to perform their work. And then on the server side or the services side, we have um, 
you know, a, a cloud security or I'm sorry, Azure Security Center that will um, enable to that will enable you to monitor all of your resources on prem or in the cloud to determine what um, compliance problems they have and you get a secure score where you can go through that secure score and do things like one click remediation to potentially fix a problem from an infrastructure point of vulnerability from an infrastructure or application point of view. So um, the, the key here is is visibility in, into all of your devices and all of your resources and you know, understanding uh, what their current hygiene is. Uh, and we need to do that for zero trust in order to determine what the risk level is. And then once that's uh, determined, um, you know, really taking action around that. I think in the past it's been more difficult to get that visibility. Yeah, very well said, uh, Joseph. Uh, in fact, visibility is the key. And the second thing, the key point which you address make resounded very well with me, which was it's a journey, right? It's aspiration. It's a continuous effort, right? As long as you visibility and you are making a continuous effort uh, to address it, because there will always be some drift which will occur. But as long as we are marching towards addressing those drifts in a controlled manner, makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, there's another question in the forum uh, regarding the COVID uh, pandemic. So the question is, we have to implement new rules and policies due to COVID. Uh, can you share some practices that you have seen that we should be considering uh, right now in this pandemic environment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Joseph. Well, I was I'm I'm all over multi-factor authentication. I, it still um, shocks me when I encounter businesses that are not using multi-factor authentication across the board because it is just so easy to grab somebody's username and password using social engineering techniques like phishing or other techniques. Now we have phishing through, you know, text messages. I, I got two yesterday. Um, you know, there's a number of ways to grab a username and password. Multi-factor authentication, although it doesn't eliminate all problems, it um, it will reduce that, you know, fish, success of a phishing attack by, you know, a good 80 to 90 percent and, you know, and it makes the attacker have to resort to other techniques like stealing session tokens after MFA has happened, uh, which is very, which is quite difficult to do. It's it's not as easy, obviously, as getting somebody to give up their username and password. Yeah, uh, in fact, one thing this pandemic has done is it has enabled the remote workforce, right? Uh, and we saw a lot change in the computing environment. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the remote workforce management, which needs to be taken into account now. Uh, all organizations were forced to open up their networks uh, and make sure that their end users can collaborate, their workers can work remotely. Uh, we are seeing the same pattern. In fact, one of the key things which I will stress on is, is not only the technology, the technology solutions are there, right? But at the same time, you also need to make your end users pretty much aware, your workforce pretty much aware about the security hygiene, the steps they need to follow. Uh, the zero trust actually became much more relevant with this pandemic environment. Uh, as we progress through this, more and more uh, trust issues started coming up into the networks and the way remote applications were uh, accessed. I've seen a few of my customers uh, where they were forced to publish their uh, applications to be accessed over the internet. And actually, the technical solutions like Azure AD really played a very, very important role out there. Just putting an app proxy in front of those applications, we were able to enable the remote access to those applications. So technology is there. Only thing is we have to make sure that those technology is architected properly and utilized in a proper fashion. So there's some due considerations to be given there, uh, but right now I think uh, the technical solutions are pretty much available in the landscape. So I guess we have just one minute left. So at this point, I will like to hand over back to Blake and Marianne and then like to wrap up. Yep. Um, thanks everyone. Really appreciate you all spending the time with us and uh, feel free to follow up with any of us if you would uh, like to receive the white paper or a copy of today's, pre today's presentation. Have a great day. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.